Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, Eugene Cousins here. All right, so today's video is going to be twofold. I'm going to be talking about instruction, so it's going to be a valuable discussion platform. I mean, instructors can give me some feedback on their experiences in the comment section. And, uh, you know, as, as technology comes into the fold uh, for, um, you know, changes in technology, the PPG smoke headset and Lolo headsets and Nirvana Bluetooth systems, all of these things have come into... Uh, into practice and using it for instruction more effectively can decrease incidences and um, increase safety so it's a nice valuable discussion and then I'm also going to be doing a second topic on this which is making a case for a good intermediate wing. Uh, I kind of feel guilty about the fact that these videos are always about or us as what I, I wouldn't say um, um, YouTube personalities but as brand ambassadors, we always try and push the, the best lighters because it's always a competition between the brands of what product is, what is the most recent product that's come onto the market and what can you get out of that product and how can that just be more joyful as far as a flying experience goes. But a good intermediate wing as a second wing option is a really good concept to have. And I'm going to be talking about the new Cleon 4 uh, that I'm you know, recent, that I recently acquired and how uh, and, and why I would want to have that as a second wing when I would use it and why it's a good uh, thing to just consider all around. Not just as a second wing, but as a first wing as well, as a primary flyer um, or driver every day. That, um, that is a really good wing as an option. And you don't always have to look at something like the Hadron um, or the um, or, or the Warp 2, where, you know, intermediate wing, uh, if it's a good intermediate wing with the latest technology, it can be a really, really fun concept and also a final concept to, to fly with permanently. So we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so for the last few years, I've had, I've been a chief instructor and um, our school has quite a few different instructors. I've had the, the privilege of training under many instructors when I was coming up in the ranks. I've been flying for more than 14 years. Um, and uh, I've also had the privilege of working with instructors, seeing how they instruct. Um, and uh, coming off the, uh, off the system of seeing how instructors traditionally teach students, how could that be improved, uh, improved on? So I've been training with my helmet for the last few years. It's not been fun to do because if I wear this helmet on the ground, my brain bikes. That's basically not a fun thing. Um, it, helmets aren't designed to stand around with for with an instructor on the ground. So when it gets hot, it's not fun to use. But the reason why I've been using this is because a duplicate system, obviously worn by the student, has got a Bluetooth, a Nirvana Bluetooth uh, link, and I can have a really good uh, clear microphone option to communicate with the student via Bluetooth, but then also the radio is connected to it as well. So you've got multiple communication systems and links with the student, which is kind of what we like what we like to call aviation redundancy system so if one system goes down you've got something else to fall back on or how would that happen if accidentally the bluetooth link goes dead due to low battery or you know the buttons pressed on the on the helmet and the student just you know murphy's law it's happened in the past uh the bluetooth goes dead and you've got radio to fall back on so using bluetooth as a sole system is not a good option using radio as a good uh, as a sole system is not always a perfect solution although that's been the traditional way of doing things and using both of them at the same time really is the best system for me as an instructor and uh, i've been seeing really good results and training times go down because of that especially on those first initial flights for the student he's one two number he's, he's first second and third flight um there's so much going on for a student if you just think about try and put yourself back into the situation when you were a student training you've got to do your pull-up You've got to make sure of the position of the wing, that it gets at 12 o'clock. You've got to remember to keep running while you're checking the wing position. And then at the, sa at the same time, you've got to start using the throttle and get it up gradually up to the max RPM. And then you've got to go to rotation at the right time. And you, at, while all of this is happening, your arm position, your leg position, where you put your feet, um, but you've got to remember to stay, you know, keep running instead of, sitting too early all these things happen at the same time it's not easy being a student and that's why you pay the big money to an instructor to uh, relay and remind the student while he's doing his first flight those flights um, that he's doing it the right way now how does the brain work I'm just going briefly i don't want to talk too much but if you study flight medical as a subject you'll understand that um, 
how the brain works is it, it you, you've obviously done trading with instructor he gives you multiple solutions for multiple scenarios that you will face now the brain identifies a situation he selects one of a couple of solutions that's been given given to him or trained and the brain knows how to do that and then he implements it and he observes whatever the reaction the the, the result is and then the system repeats itself and that we try and improve and see the brain wants to skip over all of these steps individual actual steps by just seeing a situation and implementing a solution that is why we do rep rep repetition of actions until the brain just implements an action quicker and you'll notice you know some of the instructors might notice let me know in the comment section um, that students would uh, they would struggle with something they would learn something on the first day but the next day they show up it it automatically just gels and that's why it's because you've given your brain time the student had time for his brain to data compile everything that it's learned and it's implementing those steps quicker and faster and with more understanding so as an instructor you're on the ground and you are able to uh, see these things and react and remind the student quicker if you've got a good link now this is a radio is not a is not a two-way link on a uh, on a takeoff uh, situation because the student cannot press the button to try and transmit back to the instructor the instructor is just basically hoping that he's hearing him and after a flight you would hear from the student oh i didn't hear you now the volume was down or the volume this was wrong or that was wrong and he never heard you uh, after a flight or after something went wrong so it's not a foolproof situation using radios especially if you've been around students for as long as i have I've seen that radios aren't a sole solution to use um, and um, all right, so getting to the modern technology. Now, I've made a headset from a Nirvana headset. Now, this obviously, there are other solutions to use. And with this headset, I've got the Bluetooth link. I'm not wearing a helmet that fries my brain. I'm able to have the Bluetooth link with the student and a radio connection uh, with him to be able to have that fallback plan. And it's a lot more comfortable, a lot more easy to wear. Um, um, and this is the Pelta headset that you, this, the, the Pelta uh, frame that you buy from the, the, the 3M guys. And I just mounted it on the Nirvana headset. Now you'd be able to most likely get a Volo set that is pre-built ready to link with an Volo student helmet. So it's usually the Bluetooth systems do not cooperate with each other. So the Nirvana one does not, or the BT one does not work with the Sina and the Sina doesn't work with the Volo. So there's always these little challenges. Um, and that's why you as an instructor would try to have a student helmet or sell the student a helmet that will work with uh, your headset um, if that is his choice to do otherwise you have the student headset to fall back on so i do think that this is going to be a really good solution going forward in the future uh, mike plugs in there uh, i'm not obviously i'm not going to be making these up for any other instructors but what i'm saying is is that uh, as the PPG smoke comes out and, and you have something like this, you would have a better solution. Or if you have the Nvola system that is the headset with a helmet connection, that's going to be a good solution and it decreases problems. That two-way link, let's talk about the Bluetooth two-way link. Um, the feedback that you're getting from the student is you could immediately just speak out and say if there's something wrong uh, or if he's, he can acknowledge that he's getting the message. Um, not that he has to, but you also as an instructor can monitor his breathing, you can know if he's panicking. And a lot of times, with a lot of personality types, the students are emptying their brain while they're standing there going through their, um, their checklist. And you can hear if something is wrong. This is open link. They sometimes forget that it's an open link. So you can hear the student going through, you know, mm -hmm. closing the rises, feet bars connected, uh, arms out, arms in. What is it again? trims trims i've got to check the trims so you can hear the student going through his checks and you can go over those checks with him while he's standing getting ready and you can remind him of all these small little things without having to press on the radio and he can give that feedback acknowledgement that he, he understands what you're saying to him and not just a nod um, that the traditional way would be is that you would waiting for a student to do a nod the more things that you pile onto the student to do and to have to acknowledge to you with physical in the indications like hand signs or nods or things like that that throws him off his game and his focus to be able to be more successful so uh, the open link is really good but you have limitations on it uh, one kilometer you know the scene is of one of the best systems it'll be a couple of kilometers that you'll have in range with that um, the nirvana is about a little bit more than a kilometer and 
if it's if the student stays in circuit and he listens to what the instructions that he's been given, then you won't lose the link on the neuron, the, the BT system. But if uh, if he does have a bit of a panic and he does fly a longer range to get stabilized, he could go out of range. And that's when you fall back onto radio comms. Um, so that is that is the limitation of Bluetooth is the range. And as the technology improves um, and more powerful Bluetooth links come out and transmitters come out. This will Im improve the circuit width and the reliability on Bluetooth will increase. Right, that's enough on this. I'm going to show you guys some of the videos when I go into the next course with the students and how this is used in practice. Now, the case for an intermediate glider. Um, mo most of you guys know that I've been a test pilot on the World 2. Uh, I like flying the advanced gliders. I will. I force myself to always race in the Icarus with an, the, the top glider of the brand that I promote, which is Dudek. Um, and uh, therefore, whatever the challenges on those gliders are, I have to face. Now, a top glider, uh, 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 the, 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 the most advanced gliders in, um, of any brand has, has pros and it has cons. It is more difficult to get uh, airborne with those gliders. They are small. They are, ad they, 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 they are very agile. They require faster response times. And when you are airborne with this hardship, then sometimes you're flying with other pilots and they are not airborne with the same type of glider. They could be on a high B or a C or something like that. And so you just always, you've got to fly trims close and you're not making use of this glider uh, to its full potential. So, uh, and it's, you know, um, so getting back on track, uh, there are a couple of gliders that are really good out there in the marketplace that has got the the most the the, the most up to date technologies um, in, uh, implemented in it, but it's not really promoted all that much by people like myself and other YouTubers because it's not the fastest lighter out there. And I'm going to use the Nucleon as an example. I'm now flying a Nucleon as well, Nucleon 422. Um, it's a it's a C. It, you would refer to it as an ENC if it was in paragliding terms, but we don't use it anymore. It's a DJC, but it's an intermediate lighter, um, and it's got the 2D steering. It's got really good speed it's not it's about 15 kilometers an hour slower than the warp 2 so it speed wise it's not really um all that fast in comparison to something like the warp 2 but when you're flying in a group and when you're having a nice gentle cruise and you're not racing those speeds are really comfortable to fly with what are we looking at we're looking at around 60 kilometers an hour trims open on the warp two, on, on the nucleon 2 so that it's a really fast uh, it is fast enough let's put it that way for you to have uh, a really good flying experience. It's very stable, doesn't have any roll to it. Um, so the Nucleon to me, it's been disappointing in the sense that not more gliders, not more pilots have converted to it, but it's always because they're looking at, all right, what's on the marketplace? Ooh, geez, I'm rather gonna go for the Hadron, it gives me a little bit more speed, or wow, I gotta go for the Warp 2. The Warp 2 is the fastest glider out there. You don't really have to think in those terms, especially if you're considering a second glider. You don't have to have a free ride to and a duty warp to. You could have a, one of those and you could have something that is uh, easier to fly, easier to get airborne, will offer you more consistency with your takeoff. It's a lot simpler to get airborne with a Nucleon 4 than it is with a, a warp 2. Um, to give an example, uh, the, the Nucleon here, I won't do cross country racing with it or fly camping with this specific model because it's A22. It doesn't have the same weight range. So what you, what I'd like to do with that Nucleon is to be right up against its maximum weight range, especially on these new nukes, right up at its maximum weight range. So I'd have, uh, I'd get the most I can out of that lighter, speed wise, stability wise, and fuel economy wise. Uh, comparison, I would fly, normally I'd fly a Warp 2 18. Now, 18, it's a lot smaller, it's four squares smaller, uh, it picks up more weight for that, and so I could uh, have less drag, better fuel economy, um, and get a lot more speed out of it for cross-country flying. Those three things are what drives people to the more advanced wings. But on that 22, if you're going to be flying on trims alone, it is fuel efficient, it is extremely comfortable, and it is a lot easier to fly, and it has all the modern systems to it. It doesn't have the power attack, but you don't need that, because you've got a speed bar, you've got 2D steering, and you've got plenty of speed in the riser. So it's not about flying the Nucleon on speed bar, it's about flying on the trim speed for cross-country purposes, and having a really stable platform. The Hadron is very comparative to this, the Hadron 3. Uh, it's a bit faster and it's got a better aspect ratio. So in the tougher conditions, the Hadron 3 makes a lot of sense as well. But now you're pushing it again to that 
primary very fast glider that uh, is what, that you're trying to get the most out of the glider. We're talking about uh, the case for the intermediate glider. Why that would be better as an option than the Hadron 3 and the Warp 2. And it always comes back to stability in the air, a compromise on speed, but a lot more consistency with the takeoff and a lot easier landings uh, that you would face and slower landing speeds as well. So consistency wise, you know, let's take the previous Icarus uh, champ, he's still the Icarus champion because he's never been another Icarus, 2018's been the last one. Um, and that's Allo, and he flew a very slow uh, speedster. Back in those days, those speedsters were incredibly slow compared to the Hadron XX. The Hadron XX, if you could airborne, if you could do the airborne, would just outfly anything. But getting airborne was the problem in rough conditions like this. A lot of guys would say, but oh, I'm, you know, the Hadron XX is easy. You speak to any guy being on the Icarus where you've got to fly into a tough spot that you've never been before and you're restricted to where you're going to be taking off, then it becomes a whole different ballgame. And so having something that is slower but consistent is a really good case for any kind of situation. That is my final word on it. I'm going to fly a little bit with a, with a Nucleon. I'll put some of that footage in. And um, I'm really looking forward to having that as an alternative wing to play with and fly with. All right, guys. So just getting back to the case for the intermediate lighter as a second lighter or as your primary. So what is a big advantage on something like the, uh, the Nucleon 4 is the fact that you have these sheath lines instead of unsheathed lines that you have an advanced lighter. And the big advantage is when you're flying out of fields such as my own, that is unmanicured, it's cut, but it's unmanicured, there's little sticks and stuff that could um, that could grab onto those unsheathed lines, then it can sometimes destroy your takeoff attempt and uh, infuriate you a little bit. Uh, this is a size 22. I'm going to be taking off in conditions that I wouldn't send a student up into the air, and I'm going to be just showcasing you guys um, some of the... Uh, the modern technologies worked into a lighter such as this one. All right, let's get into it. So I'm trying to sit on my camera and film at the same time. Uh, very bumpy filming conditions. In between a frontal system that's pushing through, so not ideal, but so so easy to take off with the nuclear form. It's just it's unbelievable if you just if you're used to something like a Warp 2 where you've got to be on the top of your game, the new cloud makes life so much easier. The landing is going to be a bit of a bitch because I have to squeeze in here. But before I do that, I'm going to showcase you guys what's important on something like New Cloud 4. So you've got 2D steering, as you notice, 2D, two different lines. You can hold onto the brake line, but it does not have the outer, the outer grip as it would be on the Hadron 3, but you don't need that because you've got the TC, you've got the TCT toggles and they are absolute cherry. This is what you would use if you open up the trimmers and you start gunning it. Um, very good speed that you could clock with this as well. You're not going to miss out on too much if you don't have a oof. It's all over the show and that's why you would want the TCT. You'd want to control it. Shit, I hope I can get back on the ground. It is just absolute crap. With paragliding conditions if you ask me. I'm going to loop my fingers around the top. Woohoo! It's a direct southerly wind. I cannot land in this so I've got to orbit until I get a favorable wind because if I land in a direct southerly here between the hills I'd be landing in a rotor and that is a no-go just look at how this thing is not even on full reflex mode and it's just eating up whatever these thermals are dishing up very very cool way some previous uh, speed tests on the new car, probably give you around 60. Very admirable cruising speed. I'm just gonna, gonna be able to, I'm gonna have to move this camera situation to address it now while I'm still alive. 
tuck it in here, move the camera forward because we'll go in for a nice fat crash landing. That's probably what's going to be. I did force this whole situation by flying in these conditions. Normally, what I would tell my students to do is to go find a different landing zone, but we are here to showcase the difficulties of life how a good little glider can make all the difference. If you never land on the lee side of a mountain, if it's pushing wind like this in dummy conditions, bring it in gently, hope it doesn't swing. Oh, see it wants to drop me, it wants to drop me, it wants to drop me, whoop, 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 whoop. Are you going to drop me or are you going to give me an easy day? Come on, come on, give me something, give me something to work with. Or land right on fucking top of my tripod. Oh shit! Oh, that's so much easier than what I would have expected. Ah, nice. I uh, I took off on a windsock, which is rotating the whole time because of the thermic the thermic hot spots that get created, and uh, took off like a cherry and landed quite see quite easy as well. So what you want to do with something like an intermediate glider, if you are flying in a fast glider. You should like to be at the top weight range. I think I did mention it. Be at the top end of the weight range. So you want to get as much of the performance out of this slider as you possibly can. But you do not want to go over that. So just keep that in mind. As far as the technologies go, the 2D steering, that's what you want. You want that 2D steering. You want the TCT toggles. The Hadron 3 offers that as well. The Walk 2 offers that. But this was actually the first lighter that came out with these little TCT toggles. And uh, they're just fantastic. Alright guys, hope you guys enjoyed the video. And I'll be seeing you in the next one.